He is the mightiest of all the other mice. He is one of the best fighters in the history of this great sport. Demetrius Johnson, back at it, back with me right now. DJ, always a pleasure, sir, but especially just fresh off this 1X super card and your super pro fight performance against Rod Tang in the Mixed Rules bout. Congratulations on that, and great to chat with you again, sir. Hey, thanks for having me. It was a, it was a fun fight, and I'm happy to come out of that one unscathed and healthy. Uh, indeed, in, in, a, in a wild and fun fight, not just an anniversary card uh, of sorts for the promotion in Singapore, but for you to do mixed rules with a Muay Thai star and DJ, for you to just get into a, a damn war in round one, it was fun for the fans. Uh, you know, you come over the top in round two and get the submission, but how much fun for you was it with the change in rules, knowing you got a guy coming after you to mix it up and you obviously held your own within that? Yeah, obviously the training camp for the fight was very frustrating just because we stuck to those rule sets. You know, the first round being just pure Muay Thai, second round MMA, going back and forth, training at three minutes to where I'm used to five minutes where you can set things up. And, you know, as the fight, we got to the fight, you know, it in the middle of the fight, you know, it was, we're fighting. And I think when it comes to now that the fight's done, I sit back and watch it. You know, puts a smile on my face because there's some good shots I ate and was, you know I hit him with some good shots and you know the the fan response was very 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 good so I'm pretty happy with everything overall. You know, did did his aggressiveness? Uh, I don't want to say did it surprise you because you know what he's about. You know he was coming after you, but he seemed to catch you with a hook early. Did did you kind of get a caught off guard by that? I, I knew he was going to come, but I didn't think it would be that quick like he literally walked across the cage and him with the two-piece like literally like he came I, I watched it today and I was like damn he literally came and that's that's what he's so good at that's why it makes him so special and unique is that you know usually you keep people honest you know you can't just walk across the cage or plus them in your face well obviously you can he did it but there has he has no fear factor that he'll get knocked out um, he can take a shot and to give a shot. So he did that, and I was shocked. I was like, oh, we're in a fight now. Here we go. Look, you've, you, if, if the circumstances have called for it to be a bite-down fight, you've, you've had such a well-rounded game and one of the really the best talented, well-rounded skill sets we've ever seen in the sport, so it's not like you're going to shy away from that. But do you enjoy that when things get a little hairy in there? I mean, I don't enjoy it. Usually, if things get a little hairy in there, that means you're 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 not doing as well as you thought you would. Um, but you mean those crossfires where you're having to shoot out with another athlete? I mean, they're fun to have, but you know, health wise, they're not very good because you know you're you're taking you know I don't think I got a concussion in there, but you know, I got rocked a couple of times, and you know I don't want to make a career of you know shooting out with people. I would love to use my all skill sets for wrestling, grappling, jujitsu. But for this one, it was fun. You know, it was, it was a big card, 1X, 10 years for one championship. Amazing card from start to finish. And I was happy to be part of it. You were obviously a, a, a centerpiece in, in 1X, bringing, in, sorry, one championship, bringing over some big names well-known in the MMA space in the States and really starting what, what has been, maybe the pandemic gotten away, but a move to America. American TV eventually, one, going to make the U.S. debut. I'm sure Chachri and company have big plans for that. Now that you're a couple of years into this, do you do, do you feel like you're the face of the, of the franchise, so to speak? Do you wear that willingly? Absolutely not. I feel that One Championship does a good job of promoting all its fighters. Uh, you know, you have Stan Fairtex, you have Adrian Marais, you have Yuya Wakamatsu, you have Superbon. I mean, the, I can, you know, Martin Nguyen. Uh, I can just name the whole roster, to be honest with you. And I, I think they do a great job. And you have so many different nationalities. Like maybe for the U.S. brand, yeah, maybe I, I might be the face of that because I've done a lot in the U.S. market with Fox. ESPN, the UFC, uh, the same thing with Eddie Avera, Sage Northcutt. You know, you have Japanese athletes, Yuya Wakamatsu, Tetsu Tawada, Satsuyama, uh, Shinya Aoki. Then you also have the, the Thailand market. I mean, it just goes on and on. You have the Brazilian market, John Lennergay, John Marais, Bibiano Fernandez. So it's a global scale where they're everywhere in the world where I think they do a good job of marketing all their athletes to that market, right? Like if you threw, you know, Everybody knows in America who Rod Tang is because he's such a superstar. But if you were to show, you know, an American athlete, I mean, an American audience, super bond, like, who 
we have no idea, especially where in America we're so catering to mixed martial arts. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and one's got such an interesting approach, presentation. Some of the rules are changed a little bit. What do you think could happen with this promotion? Let's say over the next year, two years, if that U.S. debut comes, if a big U.S. TV deal is announced, and let's give uh, one credit on TNT, you know, a little bit, a year ago, had, had those cards started to make an impact. It, when you look at this crowded space of UFC, Bellator, PFL, I mean, the sport is as hot as ever. What kind of moves do you think one can realistically make in the U.S.? I think the biggest thing that one has going for itself, set aside from all the other competitors, is that it has all forms of martial arts, right? Like that Hiro Akamoto and Capitan fight, was absolutely amazing. Like that, that kickboxing fight was dope. And I don't know if there's a lot of, you know, kickboxing on mainstream television nowadays. And I think that's one thing that could set one above PFL, Bellator, UFC, Rising. And Rising has some stuff, but Rising is not in the States. That's where I think they're going to excel at, right? And we also have amazing athletes. We have the grappling and we have the Muay Thai and four ounce gloves, the kickboxing, and then, of course, the mixed martial arts. So I think. Once they're able to show that skill set, not skill set, show that presentation to American fans, I think American fans are absolutely love it. You're 35, but you know you're still pound for pound ranked globally. You're still look as, you know, as as spry as ever. How long not do you think you can keep fighting? But how long do you think you could keep fighting at a truly elite pound for pound level? Uh, you know, it's all about how I feel. You know, training camp, this last training camp was great. No injuries. Uh, the previous training camp, when I was getting ready for him in December, I pulled my groin. So it was actually good to be uh, postponed the fight. You know, it, it just all depends on my body. You know, I don't do drugs. I live a healthy lifestyle, work out regularly. So it just all depends. Uh, you mentioned Adriana Marais, who, of course, is uh, one's f flyweight champion. You fought him in April of 2021. A surprising result for those who have followed your career to see you finish by strikes in round two. It was alarming, DJ, because we haven't seen that. In, in respect to both of you, respect to him as champion, how did you take that that loss based on, I, I guess I could say, the devastating elements of it? I mean, it took it like I've already lost. You know, I've lost before to Dom, Brad Pickett. Obviously, it's devastated to be uh, finished, as you can say, but... You know, I've seen my favorite athletes get finished. And the longer you do this sport, the likely chance you're going to get finished, especially when you fight, you know, uh, dangerous opponents. And when you're going to find the best athletes in the world, it's bound to happen. Like, I could have got knocked out my last fight, but I was aware of that. And I was already, I always, each time I fight, I always visualize myself winning and losing the best way and the worst way. That way, when it, if it does happen, it's not like a, a mental shock to myself, right? Um, I know a lot of people are like, no, you never want to, you never want to mentally uh, see yourself lose. I'm like, why not? It's possible. So why not just go through the motions of it? That way, when it, if it does happen, you're not a broken fucking, you know, broken person. So, but yeah, uh, it was a great fight against Adrian Marais and yeah, I just took it like a loss. I mean, I, I certainly respect that. And you've got to be able to, in any and I mean, business, you know, sports, whatever, you got to be able to learn from a loss and rebound as quickly as possible. So it seems like you're, you've always been ahead of that curve, but was there a turning point where the idea of losing wasn't going to shatter you as you were coming up as a fighter? Uh, I would say after my, Ooh, I think it was after my Domino Cruz fight, you know, I, I worked all the way up to a world title fight on the biggest platform or mixed martial arts at the time in the UFC fought loss. And, you know, then I got another contract. Like, there was like, hey, we want you to fight Eddie, Eddie Wineland in uh, 135. I was like, oh, see, things don't change, right? Like, I know I'm always going to compete, right? I think as an athlete, I'm one of those guys who goes out there and fights every single time. I show up, I make weight. I'm probably one of the easiest athletes to deal with. You know, I, you know, when I show up to my freaking fights, it's me and two dudes. It's not fucking posse. <laughs> I mean, what more could you ask for a guy who shows up to fight, right? So... Um, I think after that fight, after I lost, it, it seemed like, you know, this is kind of like my lifestyle. And ever since then, you know, I kept on winning. And then even when I lost to Rizzuto, you know, obviously you don't want to lose, but it happens and it just is what it is. Well, that was your final UFC fight all the way back in 2018, of course, UFC 227. And I felt like if anyone had deserved an immediate rematch based on your history, and obviously that would have been a trilogy between the two of you because you'd already beaten him, it was you. 
that didn't happen. You end up getting traded for Ben Askren and you're on this, you know, this, this fantastic run with one right now, but back to the idea of not letting a loss shatter you. I understand why that's important to protect that on the inside. So you Mm -hmm. don't carry it with you. It doesn't change you negatively, but in that Cejudo rematch, I don't think enough people talk about this, that look, dude, you, you kind of got a raw deal on the cards. You also had two legitimate injuries um, shout out to Cejudo that, that victory kind of made him, he used that victory to cap, a, you know, to catapult forward into, you know, now he calls himself the go in the, in the cringe and all that, but shout out to Henry for that. I don't think he beat you in that. How do you, how do you chew on that so easily DJ when you are such a competitor because you were as humble as possible afterwards. And while there is so much more need for that in the game right now, I agree. There's a difference between being humble and saying, okay, Henry, you got me, but we all know, you know, we all know. I know, at least. DJ, I know. All right? I know this. Yeah, I think just just the, the type of person I am, you know, that obviously that second fight, both fights with him, you know, was uh, uh, great fights. You know, first one I got him, the second one he ended up getting me, and it was close, right? I mean, the fight couldn't have gone any way. He had great takedowns. I did, you know, better in the striking department. I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to stop all his takedowns, stopped a couple of them. And, you know, he never passed my guard and looked for submission and threatened a submission. So when I sit there and, like, try to break it down, like, you know, T's and I's and all that stuff, I'm like, what's the point? What's happened is happened. It's done. It's done. I can sit here and moan or whatever. But, you know, he beat me fair and square. He's gone off to do amazing things, things I couldn't do, you know, winning the Bantamweight Championship, becoming a triple C. And, you know, I'm happy, truly happy for him. And, you know, you just got to – I want to see everybody win, right? Whether, whether it's in – the expense of him beating me or somebody beating me. I want to see everybody win. I want to see everybody eat. You know, they just can't eat at my table, but I want to see them succeed. I never want to be negative towards anybody in their career. So, yeah, I think when you have that mindset, it's just easier for you to digest certain things. Look, that's, I mean, that's very respectable in terms of how to, how to walk this earth and, and maintain an even demeanor, which you've done. I mean, you're the most, probably the most successful fighter I've ever seen who, willingly and purposely acts like a regular guy. I don't see you talking trash. I don't see you posting pictures of sports cars. And, and you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I've never seen that out of you. Is that just who you are? Or was that always a protective stance to be in, to not let the, the celebrity aspect, the worrying about what the media says, all that stuff that you seem to always be above, was that calculated? That's just how I am. Like, I went to the gym today, worked out, and said something to the guy, asked him if he watched Jiu-Jitsu Kaisen Zero. And he said he didn't. He was too busy watching my fight. And I was like, oh, you got to go see the movie. And I'm at home now. I'm chopping up some chicken, about to make a Caesar salad after this interview. And I go downstairs, we want, we'll do a little picking up, play little video games and pick my kids up from school. My son has a play date. So I'm a normal human being, you know, like I, like all the athletes are too. I think it's up to the athletes to display and change uh, when it comes to fame and money that's up to them. Or it might've always been that person just when they got the funding or the financials, they feel like they don't have to they be somebody else. So I've always been this way and I like to be this way because at the end of the day, I'm just a normal person that works hard and it seems to be good at mixed martial arts. But you're also a normal person who's got a, a claim in the conversation of who's the greatest fighter of all time. And that conversation, which, you know, changes on based on certain things or who's having the conversation really is about four or five fighters. You're in that. It doesn't seem to affect you, though, at all. Do you think that's something that, you know, when you're 55 years old, bouncing a grandkid on your leg, you'll think about sitting by the fire, cracking a cold one? I mean, is there a a side of you that does go, man, I've accomplished a lot. Have I accomplished more than Anderson Silva? Do you care? I mean, sometimes it comes to me, but I just I just want to be successful. That's always been my biggest thing. Be successful, be able to have a beautiful house, beautiful family, be in my children's lives, have su- successful marriage. Um, that way, when everything is done and said, you know, I feel accomplished, right? Because if I've achieved all those things, you know, you know, most second title defenses and blah, 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 blah. And my kids don't know who I am. I don't know my kids or yeah. my wife isn't, isn't in love with me. She leaves me or... I'm in debt or I owe money back in IRS tax and all that stuff. Then I'll look at my girl like, what did I have? What did I all learn from that career? That makes sense, right? Like my family and my life, my daily, day-to-day grind life, I'm going to call it grind, day-to-day life is way more important to me than my accomplishments. My accomplishments, my, my fans and 
my family, my children and my wife and all those guys, all of them, they can sit back and, you know, love what I've accomplished in mixed martial arts. But for me, I'm focused on, you know, family and make sure I'm here, my president of my children's life, my wife's life. That way, you know, because fighting is a small, small part of my life, right? You know, I'll probably retire when I'm 38 years old. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping your boy will live to like maybe 95 or 100. That's what I'm hoping for. But we'll see how things go. Dude, you have, um, I think you've won the game by that answer, meaning you have real balance. I wish I had that balance. I w- my therapist will tell you, my wife will probably tell you the same thing. I wish I had that balance and not stressing over my career every second and plotting and strategizing. I, look, I applaud you for that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there was a point in time where I, that's all I thought about was fighting. I watched it every Saturday, watched it and, and, and plotted it and scheme, not scheme, but plotted it. I need to get this sponsorship. I need to get this and this. Then it came a point in time, you know, where I was like, you know, I, I don't want to stress about this should be fun. Like I, I, I love training. I love working out, like working out and training. That shit is easy. Like somebody tell me like, Hey dude, you train for three months, you go fight someone, we'll pay you X, Y, and Z. Fuck sign me up. I can do that. Right. <laughs> but you got to have that balance. Like I, I was telling Martin Newman, um, he always leaves to go to, uh, um, florida to do his camps and he said he does two two to three month camps away from his family i'm like why would you do that like this is my opinion this is what i told him i told him straight up i was like dude i bet you you'll probably perform better if you stayed home he goes you think so mate i was like absolutely i was like dude you'll be with your wife you'll be with your kids you'll be with the people you're actually doing it for right like why why remove yourself from that 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 everyday life that what you're fighting for right like that's what you live for it's for your family and your kids so why don't you stay in that camp it's oh, i just don't be focused i was like trust you man sometimes distractions out of camp are even the best things for you right because for me i'm not thinking about fighting right i step in the gym clock in clock out go home eat eat drink sleep whatever but my kid homework oh my god he can spell i was i was doing dishes and my son i was like you want some eggs he goes yeah, and I was like, okay, can you spell A? He goes, yeah, E G G. And I was like, you can spell now. I was like, how about checks? And he goes, C A X. I was like, ah, 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 ah. So I feel like that keeps me humble and grounded. Uh, hey, I'm learning. I'm learning from you in this one. I appreciate that. All right, now it's time for the real hard questions. Uh, who's the best 125 pound fighter in the world today? 125 pounder in the world today. Now, how I've always viewed it is that you weigh in 125, not our flyweights. Like your flyweights are big. Adriano Marais is a big boy. Yeah, we're, we're, yes, we're bigger, but I consider us 135ers. That's my opinion, right? So we will be amongst the likes of Peter Yon, Edgar Marcellin, because for me, I don't, I'm not cutting down to 125 ever again. I'm not fucking doing it. Because I know I can't do it healthy, and I don't want to put that uh, trauma on my body. So when I look at the 125, um, you know, it's probably going to have to be, you know, those those top guys, uh, Figueredo, Brandon Moreno, uh, Kai Kyra France, uh, Astro Car, even though he had that loss against Kai Kyra France, and there's another one, uh, Pantoja. Like, those guys are all amazing athletes. You know, if you want to ask us, you know, who's the top in our division, it's going to come down to, you know, it's different because I know I'm a smaller 135er, but I think skill set wise, I think I can hang with guys like Peter Young, Ajima Sterling. I know Adrian Amaris can hang with those guys too. Um, they're definitely are they are definitely a lot, lot bigger. You know, I remember Ajima Sterling said he walked, he was kind of a 165. I was like, shit, I barely get over 142, and I'm having ribs and everything. So, yeah, I, I think, yeah, that's answer my question. Um, toward the end of your UFC run. And I know part of this, this transition to one and the trade, I mean, it, it, it worked out big for you business-wise. You, you, you seem very happy. So I, I don't think you have sleepless nights over it. But there was a point when you were still the flyweight champion in the UFC. Dominic Cruz became the bantamweight champion again. And people are going, hey, maybe DJ should move up and wait. Avenge that early loss from his career. Become a two-division champion. Leave that GOAT conversation in the dust. Does any part of you wish something like that happened? Were you interested in that idea back then? No, <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> uh, no, I wasn't. You know, Dominic Cruz, uh, a great athlete, great fighter. And, you know, I, I lost. I lost to him. Learned a lot from that fight. And I realized how much bigger the 135ers were 
compared to me in that in that time frame, right? Uh, even now, I think 135s are still bigger bigger for me because you know I'm I'm just a smaller guy. I'm, I'm an in between like Matt Sarah. He was he could he can make 155, but he was too small for 170. So he was at he would go back and forth try to find his way. But yeah, I never thought about that. Like I'm not a person. Like when I fight, I fight and I come home and I just forget about fighting. Like I just don't worry about it until they're like, hey, this is your next fight. You accept. I'm like, yep. Yeah. I get back in the gym. I start working and training. And I, I follow the, the sport, but it's not like something I think about doing afterwards. Like, oh. man, I should have put a five down a cruise. So I'm like, well, I don't care. Okay. Okay. Uh, so keeping back to the one flyweight division, which which I get what you're saying. It's more or less 135. What's next for you? Is it get back in line and try to try to gain that title, avenge that loss to Adriana Marais, who had a victory as well at one X and, and was really putting together a nice little run. Is that in your sights or do you see yourself more in the, let's see what type of super fight I can make? Yeah. It's get back in line and work my way back up to the title fight. Uh, I think obviously if one chapter offered me another super fight, you know, I'll, I'll probably think about it, but I think realistically me getting back to what I'm my bread and butter, which is mixed martial arts, working my way back up to a world title fight and see what happens. What is the best part about the move you made from UFC to one that maybe we don't see from the outside looking in? I think it's the athletes. I think it's the athletes. Um, that that's probably the biggest thing I truly been enjoyed. Not that I enjoyed the athletes in UFC that I, I hung out with like Tyron, Tyron Woodley, uh, Luke Rocco, DC, you know, going to the club. All, all that, that stuff is great. But I think just to see how all the athletes over in one championship were so humble, like very, very humble, like almost more humble than me. Right. Like, you know, how Rotting is, but always make sure his opponents are okay. Um, same thing with Angela Lee, even Adrian Reyes, like we're all, even Yuya Wakamatsu, like we're just all chilled, chilled pickles. Like we don't, we don't talk bad about one another. And we just want to, like I said earlier, I was like, we just want to see all of us win and, and do well. Like when the cage closes or we step in the ring, we want to be successful. But for the most part, it's just, everybody's just chilled. Like you're not going to. Is that a culture not, difference? Is that, is that, I mean, what championship be. based in Asia? It could be. I I don't know. I think. I'm sure there's probably people out there who don't dislike, who dislike each other. But I would say that's the biggest thing that I've, I've been really enjoying about being at one, like we're on a back, we're hanging out, we're chatting. And, and like it was in America too, but it's just different. Like, and being surrounded by all different dialects of language is also another thing too. Um, Cause I'm a foreigner over there. So traveling as a foreigner, put on a presentation, put on a show. It, it's something I've been really enjoying as an athlete. Um, I'm going to put words in your mouth. I've heard you say that, that it's an 18 hour flight for you in the end from yep. Washington to Singapore. Is that the worst part about being a one championship fighter? Probably. I'll probably say that would probably be the worst thing. Yeah. Um, the travel is just, it, it's brutal. It's not, it, it is what it is. There's no way around it. Right. Like if I wanted to beat the travel, yes, I could move to Singapore and, and be based in Asia and all that stuff, but I'm not going to do that. Right. So I only have to fight twice a year. Um, and the travel is brutal. You know, you go from uh, Seattle to either Japan or Taiwan, and then you have like a two hour layover and you go from there to um, Singapore. So it's part of the gig. I love it. I love it because I'm traveling, but it's, it's, it's brutal on the body. Yeah, indeed. Uh, if this one U S takeover continues and if it's this calendar year, um, you gotta be on that card. I got, I got to think, correct. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. I, um, you know, I told them that uh, I want to be competing again, hopefully in the summertime. So we're waiting on that. See, where we're going to go from there. Um, my body feels good. I'm healthy. I got a couple of trips planned. Me and my wife are going to go vacation with the kids. We're going to Mexico. And then once we get back home from that, I'll get right back into gym training. Uh, you said you still keep up on the MMA scene globally around you. Maybe not going minute by minute, but you know Peter Jan's going to rematch Aljamain Sterling this Saturday at UFC 273. I guess it's your division now, based on what you're saying with the weight cuts. Do you have a a a, a pick here? Do you have a uh, do you have interest in this matchup? I think Peter Jan. I I, I like Aljamain Sterling, but I think Peter Jan beats him. Like Peter Jan has a very interesting way of going about how he beats people. Um, and I think if you watch the first fight. Peter Jan was just letting Ajmer Sterling get off on him. And I think that's what he does. Like he covers up, he has a certain way that he covers up where he can take a shot and he's able to uh, give his shot. He, I think he's way more explosive on the feet, like with his combinations, which is that his boxing is 
far superior in that division. And I think he's going to be able to stop Ajahn Sterling's takedown and, you know, end up on top. But, you know, Ajahn Sterling said he had a legendary camp. He came off an injury in his neck. So, I mean, Ajahn Sterling could get it done, like with his grappling and his submission. And, he, and it's fighting. It's mixed martial arts. But if I have to, if my kids are like, Daddy, who do you think is going to win? I'm like, I think Peter Young's going to win. Because I think that first fight, he was taking all Ajahn Sterling's shots and defending the takedown where I think – he's going to do the exact same thing. And he's been in fucking wars. Like with that Cody Sanhagen fight, like, Oh yeah. He's been in wars. Like, so his body's well conditioned. He's he always finds it like a, not a Dustin Poirier, but Dustin Poirier, when he fought Connor, like, I think Connor, like skillful wise, he's way more, he's faster on the feet. His combinations are cleaner. Like, pop, pop, like he's quick, but Dustin Poirier has been in wars where he, he'll eat those shots. And when shit hits the fan, Dustin will always, over overcome you know then charles Oliver once again a guy who's been he's been well conditioned he's well-rounded who fights different who has you know he has that clinch game that i think dustin you know that kind of that kind of made the difference in that fight is that when they started clinching and he was on those knees i felt like some that dustin you know when he fought dan hooker when he fought conor mcgregor when he fought uh justin gaethje it was always boxing kickboxing but once charles Oliver started clinching him and he used the wrestling and the, and the grappling. That's where I saw the, the levels, the, the levels of the game. So, yeah, I, I think if I had to bet my money on it, I'll put Pierre on. Does any fighter remind you of you? Do you see anyone coming up in any organization these days where you go, oh, I got to watch that guy a little closer? There's something special there. Uh, I think everybody's unique in their own way. You know what I mean? Like uh, how I just said, you know, uh, Connor has amazing stand up, understands distance so well. Uh, Charles Oliver, very good combinations, great grappling, being able to mix it up. Um, Michael Chandler, great, great speed. Be able to switch from South of the or, I mean, Orthodox. I mean, everybody has their own unique style. And I haven't, and I don't think, and I have my own unique style that it hasn't been mimicked by anybody yet. Well, sure, you get asked this at the end of every interview. Uh, you kind of mentioned, hey, maybe you'll fight to your 38. I- I'm sure you'll fight until you feel like you can't be you, which I don't know if there's an end date on that. Do you think you'll fight under the 1FC banner for the rest of your career? I think so, yeah. Uh, this is my, my, final, my final stop. I don't see any other reason why to go anywhere else. Like if I, go back to the, if I was to go back to the UFC, I mean, I've already been a champion there. I don't just be to do fun fights, but at the same time, it's got to make financial sense. And... You know, I haven't been a, a champion over uh, a divisional champion over in uh, Asia. So it's a great goal. And I know I'm, I'm a realist. Like, I got three years left. Like, I don't want to fight. If I can fight till I'm 39 and 40, my, but my buddy Bibiano is 41. He's fighting still. But for me, it just takes so much time away from the family, right? Like, yeah. I, I my son, he wants to go ride dirt bikes. And I'm like, I got to train. I want to ride it with them. So, there comes a point in time that it's like, okay, I'm done with that. Now it's time to focus on this part of life. Well, hey, man, keep it going if you still got it. And you do. And I know you got some chicken cooking on that stove. So we've got to wrap this up. Uh, then let me close with two quick ones here, DJ. You've been fantastic. Um, no do you text Dana White? Has there ever been any form of contact since the trade? Um, I saw him at an event in Vegas. Uh, it was um, a Cirque du Soleil event. It was a run. Um, we saw each other. No bad blood whatsoever. All right. That's great. Well, he makes a lot of money, and so do his bosses, and there's a lot of fighter talk pay. So let me close this. Um, I think you're doing really well, at least it looks like, from the outside in. Do you think anything will change in the fighter pay debate? The game, You know, the, the, it's constant headlines. This executive makes a hundred millions each year. Yet this top fighter's making twenty-five to show. Will it change in your generation? What needs to be done to make a change? I don't think it will change. And my honest opinion is that we're all, as all fighters, we always want the best for ourselves, right? Which is that's just the nature of the beast, right? I mean, when I started fighting in the WC, my 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 show was three to fight, three to win, and then I was on an escalator, etc. And then I remember when I fought Ki Yamamoto, I made five and five and he made 15 and 15. So yeah, it, it is what it is, right? That's why I had a full-time job. You know, I had a full-time job. That way I wasn't too worried about the pay. 
But, you know, those executives, the same thing at Microsoft, Bill Gates, you know, makes way more than the fucking guy who's making sure the company runs every single day. That it's fire. But he worked his way up to that point. So obviously I want to see everybody fucking. I want to make sure, you know, if you're a champion, you should get part of X, Y, and Z, you know, like you shouldn't have to, if, if we're considered professional fighters, Mike Matt said, you're not considered a professional fighter until your fight money can pay through pay for your bills right yeah, so that's true. the guy who's fighting on fx or or not fx but on espn and he's making eight and eight you make 16 grand minus 20 percent. i mean you pay your coaches your training fees and all that stuff you might be walking away with i don't know maybe twelve thousand dollars if you have a mortgage insurance car payment all that stuff that shit will get eaten up super quick so um that's why i think it's important for athletes to have um, a full-time job but i don't think the pay will ever change in order for it to change there would have to be um there would have to be a unionization within the athletes and now it would take the athletes to come together i mean it's just like elon musk he, tesla workers they aren't unionized and elon musk says y'all can go ahead unionize if you guys want to like i have no problem you guys being unionized being unionized but if everybody's union that means the person who puts way more work, who brings way more to the table, can't get stock options, will get higher pay, which is how it is in mixed martial arts. Like, you know, how can you say somebody deserves what Connor makes when Connor brings in X, Y, and Z, right? Yeah. So it just that's just the way it is. Even with boxing, you know, boxing, you're able to, you know, boxing has a Muhammad Ali Act, which we don't have as fighters, where I don't know if people know what the Muhammad Ali Lee Act is, but let's say me and Kyojo Horiguchi are going to fight two guys from two different divisions or two different promotions. We can go to every single promotion out there, UFC, Rising, One Championship, Bellator, and say, me and Kyojo are going to fight. Who wants to ho- who wants the rights to host this fight? Then we can take bids from everybody else. In boxing, they can do that. In mixed martial arts, you can. Yeah. So that's why how that's how they're kind of protected. But even boxers, they don't make all the money they you know, they claim. You know, there's only a handful of guys that make a buttload of money. Fair. That's fair. Hey, DJ, you got a lot of wisdom to share. I, I smell a, I smell a podcast, a TV job. I know you do a lot of video game streaming. It's your passion, but Hey, keep up everything. Keep that balance going. You've been gracious with your time. Um, I'm looking forward to see you make a run here again at this uh, one championship flyweight title. Tell Adriano you're coming, you're coming on, bro. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Great chatting with you. Best of luck. Thank you, sir.